Welcome to the next episode of Lessons from the Lab. My name is Devin Rubin. I'm a neurologist at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'll be hosting this next episode. This is an educational program through AANEM in which we interview a special guest expert. We discuss a case, we learn from each other, and we hopefully will provide some practical information to those of you who are watching this and are practicing neuromuscular medicine and EMG. Today, we're going to go international. We have a superb guest, a really outstanding educator and outstanding electromyographer. He's uh, he's someone that uh, I'm really excited to, to speak with. He has such a vast knowledge of EMG. He, uh, he, he has had a whole career, not only of EMG, but of developing some of the tools that we use in the EMG laboratory. And uh, I'm going to give him a case and pick his brain and have him uh, maybe grade me on how well I did on a case. And uh, I hope you enjoy this. Welcome to the next episode of Lessons from the Lab. My name is Devin Rubin from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. And I am extremely excited to introduce the guest expert for this episode of Lessons from the Lab. Uh, this is someone that I don't think needs any introduction for any of those of you who are watching this and, and are involved in EMG. You know Professor Eric Stahlberg from Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, he is extremely well known in the field uh, of EMG. Uh, it's someone that that when we when I hear him talk, when we talk together, I always learn something, and I've been looking forward to to chatting. So, welcome, Eric. It's it's wonderful to have you with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Devon. How have you been this summer? <clears throat> we have had a, a good summer in in the southern Europe. It has been extremely hot, but up north here, it has been very reasonable. So, uh, 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 I can say I have enjoyed a long vacation, a long Swedish vacation. Well, I should have uh, booked a plane ticket to do this recording with you because in Florida, it's been extremely hot and it's going to probably be hot for another two months. So next time we do this, I'll come to you and we can chat there. <laughs> that is that is not a very good uh, temperature for patients with the myasthenia, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, it's not, but it's, uh, yeah, we have to use it instead of warming people up, we have to cool them down, it seems. Yes, they can They can eat ice cream and they can go into cold Swedish churches. Right. Uh, that is better than hot soup and and, uh, and uh, sauna. Yes, right. <clears throat> yes, we're, we're, uh, we're in the wrong space, wrong place. So I, it's been great seeing you this year. I know I've seen you... Um, I've seen you at a couple meetings, I think, earlier in the year, and, and it's 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 always nice. You're so you're active. You're still going to meetings. You're still teaching, but you're not. You're you haven't been practicing EMG in a while, right? You've been retired for a while. That's right. When when COVID came and the laboratory more or less had more and more restrictions, and I'm I'm an old man, then I found it uh, good to be, uh, stay away from the laboratory. And uh, after that, I have uh, not seen patients. Uh, do you do you go in to the laboratory at all just to say not hi? Not very or much, do... but, but uh, some uh, occasionally, uh, particularly for teaching. Okay. Well, even though you don't see patients now, I, I'm sure um, you can teach me something. And I wanted to, one of the goals of this this uh, webinar is to teach the viewers, and and I'd like to learn something uh, about a case and how I approach a case, and see if uh, you would do the same or or do something different. So, I'm hoping I can present a case to you, and we can, I can pick your brain. We can talk about it. Yes, that's that's right. <clears throat> it's very good to to have a dialogue about uh, these things because uh, very often there are no absolute truths around. Uh, but but we have to to uh, to uh, discuss and and find a good an optimal way forward. Yeah, and I think that's what's been beneficial as we've been doing these. That you're right. That uh, as as I found that there isn't a truth, and when I'm when I'm discussing it with other experts, that we might have some variations, even though we come to the same conclusion. 
we have different ways to get there. And uh, so I, th I think that's enlightening and eye-opening. So, so I'm going to present a case to you. This is a, a patient we had in our lab um, uh, several months ago. And it was a 63-year-old woman who was referred to the EMG lab because she was having some vision difficulty and some ptosis. And she basically had had it for about six months. She noted that uh, it came on kind of suddenly and she noted her vision was was sort of blurred. She she didn't really say it was completely double, but when, when she would look off, I believe to the left, the vision seemed blurry and her left eyelid I think it was her left eyelid, uh, would droop a little bit. It wasn't severe. It wasn't closing completely, but she felt that it was it was droopy. And that was it. She had no other symptoms, no slurring of speech, swallowing problems, limb, limb or extremity problems. It was just really the visual difficulties. So she was, I think it's no surprise, she was referred to the EMG lab with the question of, could this be ocular myasthenia gravis? So, so I, I guess my first question for you is, I, I assume you've seen, had many patients over the years referred similar to this. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and, and so in your uh, lab or in your practice, when you were seeing patients, I'm curious how you would, initially approach the patient from an electrophysiologic standpoint? Well, with these uh, symptoms, first of all, uh, the, 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 uh, you, you have to think about the, uh, what, what kind of common, what is the most common reason for this uh, type of symptomatology with a rather long history and uh, not coming from, from the childhood, but uh, developing more or less acutely and then developing slowly and it's uh, um, uh, drooping eyelids and, and uh, probably double vision that is explaining her blurred Site that I think you have two two good uh, um, alternatives, and certainly one is the the ocular myasthenia, and the other is probably some kind of, of myopathy. Uh, um, and when we now start with with our uh, uh, battery of tests, I think it's in general very important to all of us for every study that we do that we're going to apply a test that can answer, include, I mean, confirm or exclude a certain diagnosis. I mean, it's not like fishing that, that you uh, expose all your, your tests and see what you got in the net today, uh, but rather be very, um, very, this, uh, you decide what you really want to look at today. And that for now, I come to the question. Uh, in, in this case, I should uh, um, make a suspicion, make a suspicion of, of myasthenia, and I want to confirm or exclude that. <clears throat> and since we, since uh, long time, decades have uh, used single fiber EMG, that would be my first uh, test, uh, and I, I certainly start start with that in in frontal muscles and uh, uh, orbicularis oculi and uh, a, a few facial muscles. Hmm. So, so interesting. So that would be your first test, but <clears throat> you see, would you do repetitive nerve stimulation before that in this kind of patient? <clears throat> Devon, in this particular type of myasthenia, uh, as you know, the, the uh, repetitive nerve stimulation is uh, not that uh, sensitive. Don Sanders and Messi uh, and the colleagues, for example, uh, made the statistics of it, and they found that, that uh, rep stim in the face gives 48% uh, hit rate. So it's very low hit rate. So that should not be the, the first test to do. Uh, uh, and so if we have access to single fiber EMG, then I, I start with that. Uh, 
Mm. If it is generalized, generalized myasthenia, I may start with single fiber EMG, but I like to have the the rep stim as well because there you get an easy overview over many muscles in in a short period of testing. Mm -hmm. I have one more comment. It's not every laboratory and every practice that have single fiber EMG. And then we have to think in other terms. Then we at least have to do rep stim. That is the best we have for that uh, question. Okay. So I'm going to, I, I just, we're going to talk more about, I'm going to ask you more about rep, about single fiber EMG, but I'm going to show you what we did uh, to start with before we got to that point. Um, I'm going to just share my screen for a second. And certainly the clinical test is, right. I'm, I, I, we should not forget to say that <laughs> right, that is right. the first um, and important. Right. And, and the exam, her exam was <laughs> similar to what I described. She, she had, uh, she really didn't have any obvious eye movement abnormality. Maybe there was a slight a deviation uh, of of the one of the eyes, but and maybe slight ptosis. So it was one of these that was it, it wasn't real obvious clinically uh, as to what was going on. So we, so I agree with you what well, what you said, but despite my agreement, we still sometimes do repetitive nerve stimulation first and. Part of that for us, I think, is because our techs room the patient and we're in another room doing another study. And so they'll go ahead and do the, the repetitive stimulation in case we find an abnormality. Um, and in this case, they actually did spinal accessory and facial repetitive nerve stimulation. So are we bad at for doing that? Would you... Would you fault us for doing that, or just not, not, not at, not at all. This, this is um, <clears throat> first of all the way you have to do. If it was another laboratory than than yours or mine, where we don't have single fiber EMG, so that is good. And and the choice of muscles, it has to be proximal muscles, and the three that you mentioned, uh, nasalis and and sternocleido, and uh, maybe you had one more. Uh, is is uh, good muscles. Yeah, the the uh, outcome from uh, rep stim in, in hand muscle in these cases is more than zero. Right, and I would even think that the outcome of spinal accessory is probably low. And as you said, even facial is is only fifty percent, if if that. So, uh, but this was this was the spinal accessory mm -hmm. from the trapezius. These are. I think you're familiar with this. So this is these are the histograms at three at rest and then after exercise. And so I'm curious what you think about this. Is this? Uh, uh, yeah. I I have um, I have only one. Uh, well, I have a comment about the the uh, train of four. Uh, that was what we did uh, in earlier days, and you have kept that uh, that protocol. Uh, many laboratories in in the world do uh, more uh, stimuli. We have uh, gone over since many years to do ten, and you say, why should you do ten when you still measure between number one and number four? Well, first of all, you can have a surprise. Uh, with with the changes later on in some conditions that they are more decrement later and you really want to get that nice uh, profile the the general shape of, of this the, the saddle shape with the later uh, slight facilitation intra tetanic facilitation is it called so i like to do that but i measure like you do here between number one and four and and, and i think that's a good point and i think I think Don Sanders and maybe you did. There were some studies in cases where you're trying to sort out myasthenia gravis from Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome. So, not necessarily this patient, where seeing the continued uh, the, the pattern where after shock five, six, seven, eight in Lambert Eaton syndrome, often that doesn't start to repair. Whereas in myasthenia gravis, you, you might start to see the repair. Is that mm. kind of what you were alluding to? 
Yes, or, yes, mm. exactly. And, and other, I mean, more more seldom uh, conditions like like MacArdle, they they continue to go down and down. So uh, I, uh, I I I feel more confident with the total quality of the of the study if you see the ten, and it's not that painful. We have not. Uh, uh, had to to uh, stop a study uh, after four stimuli because it was too pain painful. Uh, it worked well. Okay. So in in this study, the it may be hard to see, but the amplitude decrement after exercise was somewhere right between five, three, and six, but the area was a little higher here, 10, 11 to thirteen. Do you think this is technical a technical problem, or could you think this is real? There's a discrepancy between amplitude and area. No, yeah, there is uh, there is a discrepancy in the normal subjects and also in 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 patients with some kind of disease. So uh, no, I think this is uh, absolutely perfect. And um, I don't know what you consider abnormal. This is very different in, in the world also. In earlier days, we said 20%, and that was due to the width of, of the ink line in the, in the, in the, yeah. uh, in the ink writer. Uh, later, we came to 15 and uh, 12, and then somebody, some people have stopped at around 10%. Uh, you know, the new muscular junction in itself has no decrement at all um, in, in a normal. You, you cannot see that. Um, it is um, uh, actually the other way around that the amplitude may increase for, for many different reasons within the muscle fiber. So um, we, we should have zero, but that is not possible. We must add some, some technical uh, uh, possibility for, for errors and so on. So I made a, a, a summary of uh, a, a group of, of patients retrospectively, and I found that five percent covered covered the, the uh, normal material. So we have used a five percent, but but many used ten percent, and I think you used ten percent. But uh, remember that if we if we move that figure up to 12 or 15, then we allow kind of artifact, more artifacts, and, and we lose some of the sensitivity. So um, I think it's uh, instead of just increasing the number uh, for normality, it's better to improve the quality as much as possible. Yeah, I think those are fantastic points. And, and you know, I think the point that normal decrement is zero is an important point. Whenever I ask that to our residents, or they always say, "Oh, it's ten percent," but you're right; it should be zero. And and in our lab, I'm I'm a little cautious about calling five percent because I know because of technical factors. But I'm not. But it's not an absolute ten percent is the cutoff. And we we did a study at Mayo in a series of our myasthenic patients and found the optimal sensitivity without uh, 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 without reducing specificity was about seven. So, you know, kind of yeah. if I see consistent real decrement of 7%, mm -hmm. 8%, uh, I'm comfortable and even 5%, but I'm a little more cautious with that. Yeah, absolutely. That That is really the, the uh, uh, lower limit. So I, I agree with you. 7% seven, 7 is fine. And that is the standard of, of your... Uh, your uh, laboratory, so we we buy that. And one thing that both you and I are very keen about is to look at the signals themselves uh, in the to the left in this uh, panel here, so that you see takeoff and you see late components and this and that. And to the right, you you see the bars, and that is a harmonic change in in uh, amplitude, not jumping up and down. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, in in the near future, we will we'll define how much of jumping up and down we can allow, uh, which is indicating movement of electrodes and, and so on. So uh, quality can be quantitated from, from these uh, bars. Yeah, 
Yeah, and especially even with 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 AI and computer learning, hopefully that'll be something that can can we can have some type of warning that this is not a normal pattern. So people who aren't as familiar with it will not over diagnose based on uh, technic a technical problem. So yeah. So okay. So we did the the trapezius, and then we did a facial. Uh, same thing, facial repetitive stimulation. And here, there isn't really much decrement, really isn't no. any. So, so are, you, kinda... are you proud? Are you proud of this? No, I'm never proud. My the text, <laughs> no, I'm never proud. Never perfectly <laughs> proud. <laughs> I think what happened. I mean, if you're asking me. Well, I'll ask you. What do you what would you not be proud of? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you see, you see the problems we have with uh, with the rep stim in in the last uh, four runs. There, it's uh, it's increasing a little. Uh, the the uh, light uh, green. Uh, I think that is a right positive here. decrement of, of something. Yeah, uh, and um, I, I think that is technical. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. amplitude, if you just look at the first trace yeah. in the numbers, the amplitude is dropping, just the absolute amplitude. So maybe there was some some movement of the stimulator or something. The amplitude goes down. Mm. So, and yeah. Nasalis is certainly a, a very difficult muscle because, uh, you know, all the studies, we want to have supra maximal stimulation. And that is more or less hopeless when it comes to facial muscles, because if you activate nasalis to a good point, then you increase the stimulus a little, and then all of a sudden you activate risorius and zygomaticus and other neighboring muscles. So it's very difficult to, to get the clean supramaximal nasalis. So we have to allow this kind of, of quality. The, the quality here is acceptable, I think. Yeah, acceptable, but not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, but anyway, I think with the, I felt with these two repetitive nerve stimulations, there was not sufficient, it was not definite decrement to at least certainly not enough to say with, with certainty that this is a neuromuscular junction disorder. And as you said, it's not specific, even if there was for, for neuromuscular junction disorder, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't, I wasn't too impressed from a pathology standpoint with, with these two uh, nerves. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. Yeah, I agree with that. And are you going to show something more on rep stim? Otherwise, I have two comments. <clears throat> no, though, that was the only rep stim that I that I okay, did. Okay, very good. Uh, one question is: <clears throat> Did you do a, a short or long term activation? I mean, I remember in one of your your webinars you had, you talked about the one minute exhaustion and to see. A, more definite uh, decrement because in the previous picture i mean it it, it is an in tendency to to decrement there i i think and yeah the, the, with, with activation wouldn't that have been uh, coming coming out much better yeah actually this is post activation so it's difficult to see on these ah, slides ah, so the first three traces are at rest and then the fourth is immediately after one minute of exercise and then 30 seconds, one minute, two minute, three minute. Oh, after. Wonderful. So wonderful. I think you're right that if there's worse, somewhat worse decrement here, that's about two or three minutes after exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The, <clears throat> the short term activation, except when we use it for, for presynaptic uh, conditions like, like Lambert Eaton, I, I have played around with with um, ten second activation in the way like like you you get the feeling for the conduction in the the motor amp plate uh, that is like a booster dose of, of tensilon or whatever. If you activate just ten seconds, um, then you get an increase in in release of acetylcholine, and if a questionable decrement like uh, in yellow four bars there. If that all of a sudden, after 10 seconds of activation, in, uh, 
is abolished and you have no decrement at all, then I tend to believe that the yellow there is a, a kind of, of um, decrement. That is how I use the, the 10 seconds to see if I can facilitate the, the neuromuscular transmission. So would you would you usually have the patient ac exercise for 10 seconds and then after that have them and then give a set and then after that have them exercise for a longer period of time and 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 take it out for a few minutes? You would in, do both? In and the one minute test is definitely in the cases where the rep stim is not showing any abnormality or if it is showing a questionable abnormality, we want to, to uh, provoke the, the, the failure by long-term activation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, so, okay, so that was all the repetitive nerve stimulation. And then, um, and then we did go on to the needle exam. And you mentioned at the beginning that your, your, your primary test would be single fiber EMG. Do you, perform a routine needle EMG of the muscle first before you go into single fiber or do you just go right into single fiber? Unfortunately, I should say I go right into single fiber <laughs> okay. EMG and people say you must do EMG before. I do the other way around that <clears throat> when I do the single fiber EMG, we get a very good sense of of the distribution of muscle fibers in the motor unit. I'm I'm talking about re-innovation because that is the, the pro problem with single fiber EM jitter, because jitter is seen also in early re-innovation. So if it, when I do the, the single fiber and it's unusually easy to get pairs, then I say, ah, oh, is this a tendency to, to, to neurogenic uh, involvement? Then I do EMG afterwards, for sure. Okay. But we do not usually start with EMG in all cases and not n nerve conduction. Certainly nerve conduction has more nothing to do with the the symptomatology in these patient i should say but but emg is reasonable but to your question we do not unfortunately perhaps do emg before we do it after if it is unexpected findings in sf emg okay so you made a comment and i'm going to ask you and it's either going to make me feel bad or feel good but you said when when it's relatively easy to collect pairs, I was under the assumption every time it was easy for you. It, it single fiber, so, you know, how, how long would it take you to do a study? Uh, 20 minutes per muscle for, uh, for 20 uh, good pairs. Uh, that is a kind of, of uh, routine, sometimes easier, sometimes more difficult. I'm uh, preferring the, the um, facial muscles in, in uh, these types of cases. I sit behind the head, at the head end behind the patient uh, and just um, lift my, my uh, hands down to the, the, the forehead or, or the uh, around the eyebrows or the chloris oculi mm -hmm. um, in, instead of sitting in front and coming uh, approaching the patient from front side it's it's not so easy so you said you would sit next to the patient you said like next, yeah. you're next to him and then you're coming in yeah, yeah. like this. I, yeah. I have my chair behind the the coach would you typically do frontalis or orbicularis oculi or or as your first choice we we do we do the two um, little depending. Uh, often I start with frontalis and, and then we do the orbicularis oculi. If frontalis was normal, mm -hmm. if frontalis was abnormal, it does not add anything to to test another muscle also. But you have to to think of, of uh, facial palsy in the history and think of Botox, which is the important thing. Right. Then we, uh, if frontalis is normal, I go to orbicularis oculi. There is a little more tendency to to have a, a hematoma. Perhaps it one per twenty patients we see a little bruise here, uh, 
And if that is also normal, we don't go on, on to number three. I have done that before and now looked at statistics. It doesn't really add anything. So so two muscles. What's the, what's the most unusual muscle that you've done single fiber on? <clears throat> well, it's... Um, <laughs> have you ever done the tongue yes yes and and there also you can do emg and single fiber in in uh, levato palpebra or, or rectus superior uh, very high frequency is difficult to to um, to get the uh, um, low low frequencies for for the analysis but uh, um, in some laboratories, I, I know an article from Noguez and, and Antonio um, Rivero in, in Argentina. They, they published an article about doing EMG in these types of patients uh, by, by putting a needle either through the uh, eyelid and, and get um, the thin uh, levato palpebra and the rectus superior get very nice uh, recordings there. Huh, interesting. I always yeah. thought, I, I didn't realize that, I'm not familiar with that, but it always made sense to me that that would be a higher yield muscle if you could reliably do it when patients have ptosis, because that's yeah. the muscles that, yeah. that's weak. So Exactly. <laughs> well, I'm going to show you three clips of sing a single fiber. This is with concentric needle um that were recorded from this patient and maybe you can grade them a, a b c d or an f as a recording and comment on it so um is, is that okay yeah <laughs> and you can be as hard as you as harsh as you want in your grading but this was one. this, this was one Good quality. Is A the best? A is the best. Yeah, A is the best. F is uh, fail. Then this is fantastic. <laughs> uh, I have uh, the comment that the amplitudes are very low. Which filter do you use? This is a, a th this is a thousand hertz uh -huh. for okay, low good, frequency. Good. Yeah, yeah. I see that here. Sorry. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, now I have, and, and this is normal. And the um, sweep speed, I usually use 0.5. And you see, um, you have plenty of room for uh, 0.5 milliseconds per division here. And okay. uh, uh, that, that helps to, to, to look at, uh, at the jitter oh. a little better. Okay. So this amplitude um, on the second spike, it is low, but not so low that I mean, you would feel that this is a reliable pair, even though it's no, a low I, amplitude. I think this is really very reliable, and and the disturbances are, are really minor, so this is fine. Yeah. Okay. I like All to right. say I I like you have superimposed at the bottom there a number of these charges, and I don't think they are so many, perhaps ten or so. <clears throat> if you should have a setup that the bottom panel has a superimposition of all your hundred discharges, for example. That is not so good because if you have a slight trend in the time interval between spike one and spike two, and you have a slow, slow uh, trend, then you will see a very wide distribution down at the bottom there and mm -hmm. misjudge this to uh, to be a high jitter mm -hmm. so uh, i i like you to do uh, that you did this you imposed a, a, a low number uh, 10 mm -hmm. or 15 not more right okay okay that's one this is the second one Try to stop it here, where mm. right there. 
So uh, <laughs> uh, that is a little more difficult because uh, uh, because of, of the combination of three mm -hmm. three spikes, um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I can say that a disturbance. Uh, if this, if you consider this as a variable shape and, and all that, we uh, we uh, can look at the jitter and the jitter of the green one on the middle one. There is only thirteen, so that is normal, and it's very little chance that an artifact should reduce the the jitter falsely. Uh, so mm. I, I think it's correct. Um, in 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 the bottom line, it looks like some individual. You see a line there, on, right here. On num yeah, on number two, on number two. Yes, and right there. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it, it it could look like another a single unit is a single spike is also triggering. But uh, in the display raster display, you see all the three right. spikes together. So. Um, I think this is uh, this is correct, and the value is very reasonable. It it fits to what the eye is saying, and um, uh, also uh, uh, the the numbers. <clears throat> the thing is that if the spikes are closer than hundred fifty microseconds, uh, they interfere so much that mm -hmm. the jitter in that case is a little reduced. Uh, but the, the setup, I, I think I know the machine you have here, the setup is such or can be set up so that if the interval is too short, then the system uh, will cancel mm -hmm. uh, the recording. And right. here, obviously, it has at least occasionally uh, uh, measured it was green dots but right. not all the time not all of them yeah yeah mm -hmm. so you're talking just for the the listeners this second spike which does seem to be separated from the third yes, spike yes. but if it was if it was a little more to the right yeah. sort of on the more on the slope of that that yeah. might not be reliable to I, measure you might have no. the, the jumping it might be jumping and measuring yeah. that spike differently okay so so good quality okay and then let me show you one more. So here's the third one. I'll play it. Uh, I'll play it again here. Hmm. Mm. So mm doesn't sound like an A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, what do we do with this? <laughs> um, I, I think that um, I, I think that uh, this is um, in essence a normal jitter. I, I th think. Um, let's see. The sweep speed is is so and so. Yes, and and. Um, um the the there is one that is green uh, yeah, this green, little one right here th th that Wait. one should not be accepted i think right because that is definitely not a clean spike and and that you can remove from the plot to the right yeah, yeah you can uh, i this is just a still still yeah, video yeah, yes. no, but yeah you can right it's good but but uh, <clears throat> i i i really think that uh, uh, these two uh, high spikes are good. The problem with this recording, if there is a problem, is the the um, activate degree of activation. Perhaps a little too much, and one should ask the patient to relax a little. That is the yeah. most common uh, command I have to patients: relax, relax. So, so that's kind of my question for and reason for showing this. That you know, what happens? If the patient relaxes and then this spike stops the fire, uh, stops firing, and then they activate a little bit and you get this again, but you get the, you, there's there's a second and maybe a third motor unit, separate motor unit. Are you, would you be okay 
keeping this and now with the machines you can you know you can edit you can click and drag a box and get rid of the background one mm -hmm. is that fair to do that or is is should this be thrown out because of that it is uh, probably fair but i don't I don't like the, the post editing very much. First of all, it takes time. Secondly, it is not really statistically fair to to do manipulations of the signals afterwards. The best is, uh, I'm, I'm sure that you let the patient listen to the sound uh, mm -hmm. because it's so great difference to, to have a silent uh, machine or have the sound on. Patient can train and learn to, to slow down a little. And uh, um, so my, my, my answer is um, try, try one minute more and, and train the patient and see if they can relax a little more. Okay. So you'll give, you'll give me a C on this one, a C or a B. So. Yeah. See, okay, okay, good. <laughs> so, so this, you know, there were, and there were other pairs that were collected, and and I guess the ne the question then, the other question for you is, in this patient, the things all looked good. The collecting more pairs looked good. They were all within normal limits. There's, if you look down here, I think that was one that I threw out. It was a, not a clean uh, pair, but if if someone's having trouble collecting 20 pairs for whatever reason do, do you are you a proponent of the futility studies that say if the first 12 or 15 pairs are normal the chance of you getting uh two abnormal or three abnormal pairs for the last group is so low that you can stop without collecting 20 mm -hmm. pairs or do you think you have you should always collect twenty pairs, at least twenty? If uh, all all the chances are equal, then you can statistically decide whether twelve is enough and how big a chance it is to 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 find more um, later on. <clears throat> I, I don't use that. I I make it simpler. Um, if um, we we consider three or more uh, pairs. If three or more pairs are abnormal, then the study will be normal. Can you see if you have done if you have done four recordings, and and um, uh, two of them are abnormal, then the study will be abnormal. Right, because fifty percent are abnormal. Yeah, is that and, what you're and, saying? Yes, and I don't use uh, percent. I, I really don't. The the reference values are uh, and and the rule of having more than two is dependent on that we record from twenty. That the cutoff is twenty. So if if we have three abnormal, uh, then the study is likely to be uh, abnormal, uh, and. Um, I tried to, I tried to, so we can stop earlier. If, if five recordings are abnormal, you can stop there. Uh, even if you only had uh, studied uh, 12 recordings. Mm -hmm. If we want to exclude an abnormality, I think we have to go up to a reasonable number. Uh, I aim for 20 and in, in uh, statistics and in publications and so on, I have accepted 15 and write that clearly that we have based the study on down to 15. I mm -hmm. aim for 20. Okay. And, and do, maybe, do you have any advice? Um, and this may be hard to answer verbally without this being a demonstration, but you, you seem like someone who never gets flustered, never gets frustrated. But I think as we all know, sometimes, at least for me, when, when I'm doing a single fiber study and patients, I just can't find pairs very well. It's taking mm. time, you know, I'm trying not, trying to not get frustrated, but do you, do you have any advice or technique or anything you do if, if you're searching and you're just not getting good pairs after uh, several minutes? Uh, Devon, <laughs> I can tell you when Exet and I worked on developing this uh, technique in the 60s, 
uh, we said it must be possible to get a single fiber. Theoretically, with this needle that we build ourselves, we inserted that in my my thinner muscles, and we were poking and poking for 18 hours without sleep and dinner. <laughs> and then finally we got the single fiber potential. So the 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 first the first recording took 18 hours per pair, and then it has been reduced very much. Uh, I I say it's definitely a matter of training, uh, but but in your case, I mean you have years of training in in this, so uh, it certainly the patients uh, degree of cooperation also if they move or if they uh, have too much activity, which is the most common uh, problem. But um, no, I think you, we can uh, usually get uh, enough with with. Uh, well, what, I, I don't yeah. know what I should say. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, we've had situations where, you know, I, I think for our fellow when they're training and even for staff where we, you can't go into the study ha having, having to be rushed. You know, if no. you have another no. patient or you have, you know, you know, I have a meeting to go to in 15 minutes, that's not going to mm. work. That, no. And I think that's no. advice that I would share with trainees or someone learning this is you just understand this may take some time. And I tell patients this, it might, this might take me a half an hour to collect what I need to collect mm. and not mm. feel rushed and, and because that doesn't no. do anyone any good. And yeah. it can be worth it because, uh, and the other situation where you have a patient and you you do a rep stim and that is borderline and then you try after three months and it's borderline again, it can take a long time until you ar arrive at the diagnosis uh, with single fiber EMG. If you spend a few more minutes, uh, 15 minutes or even 30 minutes more, you may be able to, to get the correct situation. Right. Well, I want to, before we end, I want to show one more clip because I want to end on an A, an A plus. This was not from this patient, but it is a single fiber study from a patient that had similar findings, uh, similar symptoms. And this was the, the study. Yeah. So do I get an A Beautiful. plus for that one? <laughs> okay. Big, big applause from here. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to yeah. comment, make any comments about what this is showing? Um, or? I, I think it is, uh, it's a very nice recording and listen to the sound. It is, uh, you can actually tell when you're out in the corridor and hearing that your colleague must have a myasthenic patient in the room. So th this is wonderful, and <clears throat> we we um, we try to at least make one of the spikes optimal in amplitude and trigger on that, and then see the jitter displayed either on a preceding signal or a follower. Uh, like this, it is a follower, um, and here you want to see if there are any blocking. Uh, that means a line through the base of the signal and. A, you don't yeah. see that uh, here, uh, and and the jitter is something like seventy. If the jitter is more than hundred, then it should also be blocking. Yeah, and I do have one other clip since you mentioned blocking that does show. It may not be as good of a clip, but I think this one shows blocking. Yeah. Oh, this is nice. Very nice. Lot of yeah. blocking. So you can mm. see a lot of blocking and the jitter. Yeah, mm. was 150, I believe, here mm. on this yeah. one. So, yeah. Here, here. Oh. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Very, very nice. Mm. So, if you did, if I, if this patient, we did those, this example and the one I just showed you, both of those were highly abnormal. And maybe you collect one other pair and it's abnormal. You could just stop and say, this is an mm. abnormal mm. study. Yeah. 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 Okay. As long as you have more than more than two. Yeah. But but then if you got this, would you then would then you would you just flip over and do a concentric needle to make sure there wasn't myopathic findings or no. would you no, you would no. say this is enough. 
my 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 opathy, um they uh, have a little uh, little jitter uh, as as um, as a group of, of patients, uh, but uh, not not uh, a pronounced uh, jitter at all. And and uh, so we, I mean, uh, the myopathy diagnosis with EMG in the face is very difficult, isn't it? So uh, yeah, so, it's so hard, I, right? I, Mm. Yeah, yeah, I I must uh, add one thing, the uh, two things, <clears throat> the rep stim can confirm a disturbed neuromuscular transmission, but we cannot exclude it, particularly in the face. I mean, we talked about fifty percent. The single fiber EMG has a sensitivity in in certain hands and some certain publications uh, 99% in generalized and 97 in in ocular uh, so it, it is uh, possible to uh, make the diagnosis very very unlikely with single fiber emg i i hate to, uh, to use the word exclude but it's very very unlikely uh, that is not true for for epstein mm. and another thing if you go into a weak muscle if the weakness is due to neuromuscular problem then you must see that in jitter and blocking blocking <clears throat> if you have a weak muscle man no blocking a little jitter but no blocking then the weakness is due to other things for example, a myopathy where the weakness is due to the contractile properties and the loss of fibers and so on. It's not a neuromuscular problem. Do you think that if someone has a weak muscle that you should be, and it's due to a neuromuscular junction problem, you should be able to identify unstable motor unit potentials with a concentric needle and not need absolutely. single fiber? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that was the very first sign of EMG abnormality in 1934 when the first publication came about the variation in amplitude in motor unit potentials um, yeah. and that can be used you put in an ordinary concentric electrode and see the shape of the motor unit potential you don't need to make them to single fiber but you can see the compound motor unit potential yeah and I think that's a good point for people who don't do single fibers to not ignore the motor unit stability or instability when you're doing your routine EMG. Yeah. So, well, well, this has been enlightening and terrific. I, I'm wondering if you have any uh, any final words of advice for anyone watching this related to <clears throat> EMG or based on your career or history or anything that they can take with them. If you, if you, and. Uh like to go into this and uh, the most difficult is to do it on your own arm first of all you are normal and secondly it you are not so good to be both examiner and and patient at the same time try on a colleague try an extensor digitorum communis or or facial muscle and the easiest is to have a patient with a slight uh, pollen neuropathy, for example. Uh, there you can get a lot of pairs and, and you can try to, to hold them for a few seconds to, to get uh, enough discharges. We, we, we want to have 50 discharges uh, in for uh, in a recording. Yeah, I think that's a great point that when we teach our fellows, it doesn't have to be a myasthenic patient that you do single fiber. You can do it on any any patient, especially since we use no. a concentric needle now, just flip over to the program and collect a few pairs at a time. Yeah. And that's a good way to help train and improve the skills. So yeah. Devon, you asked about the funny funny um, um muscle to test. Uh, I've seen a few few live um my standing dogs, uh, I, I, uh, I, they were just lying uh, flat on the couch with without any anesthesia or anything, and uh, I lifted up the the foreleg and uh, uh, made the recording from from deltoid that I can grade a little. Got beautiful recordings and uh, the diagnosis of myasthenia was within ten minutes, so that was fantastic. Oh, wow. uh, that so I I had. Quite quite a number of those, or a low number, six, seven, um, and uh, horses I've seen 
as and, and horse horses have the same motor unit potentials than than men but uh, that is another talk. wow well that's if i get bored you know with all, <laughs> seeing all the patients i might have to bring some animals to the lab and try that out <laughs> so. Well, it's this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, having this great discussion. I think there's so much information uh, and you have so much knowledge. It's great to learn from you. Uh, I'm glad you gave me at least an A on a couple of those those yeah. clips. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and uh, no, thank you no again. Problem. And yeah. I look forward to seeing you soon again yeah. at, uh, at a meeting. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Devon. Have a good time. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Lessons from the Lab. Professor Stahlberg is just a wonderful, knowledgeable person, and I always learn something when I chat with him and, and hear him speak. Uh, I, I did learn that I, I'm doing okay with single fiber. I was graded pretty well, but I think that the, the points he made are important points, that it's uh, not an easy technique. It takes practice. And uh, it's important both with single fiber EMG and repetitive nerve st stimulation to really scrutinize the recordings to ensure that they're technically reliable in, in the assessment and interpretation of the findings. It is interesting, uh, but makes sense that single fiber EMG may be the go-to test, particularly in patients who have only ocular symptoms. And I think, as I said, in our experience, repetitive stimulation doesn't usually help us a whole lot. And we ultimately go to single fiber EMG in the ocular myasthenia patients anyway. Um, but both techniques are, are useful. They're complicated techniques, and it is important to, to ensure technical reliability. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, hopefully, none of you will go out and bring your pets to the EMG lab and practice single fiber EMG on your dogs. But if you do, um, you can always call, call, contact Dr. Stahlberg for tips on doing it on your, on your pets. So enjoy, and we'll see you next time.